been talking to you guys a long, long time. And I want to bring you up to date on things that are going on in my house. Okay? You remember my dog's name? What is it? Just in case you forgot it's BJ. Yeah. He's a little black too. No, it's BJ. And then I've got two cats. Can you remember what their names were? One's name is Spring. And one has had her name changed three times. It's been from Faya to Destructo Cat to Applehead. Okay? So now we've got DJ and we've got Fred and we've got Applehead. And our house, do, do cats and dogs get along? Yeah, no, sort of, kind of. My one dog gets along with a cat. Oh, he does? Yes. What if there were two cats? Does he get along with all of them? No, just one. Oh. I'm going to talk about my bird and my one bird. And your one bird. Cockatiel, uh, what's his name? Uh, Buddy. 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 Okay. Buddy. Well, let me tell you. You know, I find that when I look at, at the way that when, you go to school, don't you? You, go, you don't have school tomorrow, do you? No. Nope. You don't have school tomorrow. <laughs> Yes, that's right. Are there kids at school that you don't get along with? I have a Uh-huh. You get along with everybody. Well, do you know, at my house, you would think that there would be a lot of chasing and growling and meowing and carrying on, wouldn't you? With a dog with two cats? Maybe a little bit, maybe not. Well, you know, surprisingly enough, you don't know about it, but these folks know about the parade that occurs every morning and every evening in front of my house. When I take when I take DJ for a walk, the cats line up and they walk with us every morning and every evening. And surprisingly enough, they get along just fine. They kind of sleep in one another's beds. They drink water out of one another's bowls. You know, and they just get along just fine. And I've wondered why is it. That if dogs and cats that are supposed to be mortal enemies can get along, why can't people? Because sometimes dogs and cats live with each other, but people don't. Like Nico grew up with each other, but not other people. Ah. Does that mean that if dogs and cats
He left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to the city of Samaria called Sychar, and the parcel of ground that Jason, Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being worried from his journey, was sitting thus by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. And there came a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And the Samaritan woman therefore said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And then you all know how Jesus conversed with the woman, and he was telling her about the water, the, 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 uh, that, that she would never thirst again if you drink from that well, and so on. And then we skip down to, to verse 37. And at this point, or 27, at this point, his disciples came, and they marveled that he had been speaking with a woman. Yet no one said, What do you seek, or why do you speak with her? So the woman left her water pot and went to the city and said to the men, Come and see a man who told me all things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? And they went out of the city and were coming to him. Jesus then tells him a little parable. And then in verse 39, And from that city many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, and he told me all the things that I have done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they were asking him to stay with them, and he stayed with them two days. And many more believed because of his word. And they were saying to this woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. Let us pray. Our Father, we come to you again thanking you for the privilege that we have of entering into your divine presence. We thank you, Father, for all the blessings of this life. We thank you for the blessings of this past week. We ask, Father, that you would help us to cleanse our minds and our hearts of all the things around us this morning that we may meditate upon your word. We thank you, Father, for looking over us. We, we ask that you would look after our men and women overseas. We pray that you would protect them. We ask that you would be with all of those on our prayer list. This morning I ask, Father, that the meditations of my heart and the words of my mouth might indeed be pleasing in your sight. For we pray, Father, in the name of Jesus. Teresa called me Friday night and left a message to call her. And so, you, you know, when you never leave a message as to why you're calling, <laughs> you always call back. If they tell you why they're calling, sometimes it doesn't have to, you know. So I, I called her back, and I'm thinking something bad has happened. You know, somebody had passed away. And she said, what I really need, I, I need a big favor. And, and then she put the guilt trip on me. We don't do this very often. I don't ask you that. And, and so um, I was happy to say yes, Teresa, you know, uh, I'll talk about it. So what do old preachers do in cases like that? Well, I've got a busy day planned on Saturday. Uh, but that's okay. I'll get into the old files, and I'll dig out an old sermon, and I'll rework it, and we'll be fine on Sunday morning. So I got out an old sermon, and I reworked it. I reworked it again, and I reworked it again, and I reworked it again. And finally, I got tired of reworking it because it just wasn't going to work. Well, by now, it's, uh, it's time for me to go for my morning walk on Sunday morning. Like, well, okay, we'll put that aside, and I'll think of something to talk to the kids about. So I'm walking, and I'm trying to think of something to talk to the kids about. And I keep going back to what am I going to talk to the adults about? And then I realize that a lot of times that what I talk to the kids about, the adults got more out of than what I talk to the adults about. So I just decided I would kind of flip things around this morning and I would take the topic that I had chosen for the children and we would talk about that this morning. And I will have to confess that I don't have a lot of notes. I am, I am walking right out on faith, but... You have always come to me to speak much pretty well. It's on my mind anyway, haven't you? So, uh, here we go. I was going to talk to the children this morning. I thought, you know, they're not going to make school tomorrow because tomorrow is uh, Martin Luther King Day. And I 
thought, well, maybe we need to talk about this as adults. The civil rights movement in America. I had, uh, back years ago, when I was a veteran in the 60s, we had vespers every night. And there was a lot of stuff going on in the 60s. Some of you will remember, some of you won't. I can remember the March and Selma. I've often wished I'd gone. I can remember when the three civil rights workers were killed. I can remember when buses were burned. I can remember watching on TV as the fire hoses were, were, were uh, uh, turned on, on the black population in Birmingham. I can remember the dogs being turned loose. I can remember the days when, as white people, we could drink at a certain fountain anytime we wanted. But a black person couldn't. I can remember when we were free to use any restroom we chose to use. But a black person couldn't. And I can remember Dr. King, and, and I always admired his, his method when we had the Black Panthers, and they were, they were pretty hostile, and they were pretty violent. But Dr. King believed that love overcame all things. We had all of these things going on, and then, as you will recall, some of you will remember this day, when Rosa Parks said, I'm not sitting in the back of the dirty bus. I'm not doing it anymore. And it created quite a stir. I was on campus at that point. I knew this stuff was going on, but it really didn't affect me. And one night I was speaking of Vespers. There weren't a lot of us together, but there were a few. I remember standing up one evening and I looked down and there was Randy Jacobs sitting on the front pew. Any of you know Randy? Randy's chalk talk. Stan Wood, any of you have ever heard of Stan Wood? Stan teaches at the seminary in Memphis. It's Dr. Stanley Wood, uh, African American from Mississippi. John Gam, the son of McAdoo Gam from Hong Kong, the city on that front row. And Don Tabor from Kentucky was sitting there, and I, and I thought, you know, we got red and yellow and black. And I look at the way things are going in our nation today, and I look at the way we treat our fellow man. You know, for how many years did I preach from the Sermon on the Mount? And Jesus told us there in that sermon how we're to treat one another, didn't he? And I look today at, at the way that we are treating, and I, I think about the civil rights movement, and we've come a long way with in regard to our relationship uh, with the African American community. I heard that you had a heck of a service there during the revival. Amen. Amen. You know, a lot of people criticize the African American community because they are so uninhibited. And I love the black people for that. They pretty much say what they want to say. They think what they want to think. They, uh, they, they are very, very expressive about it. And I guess you got a real good dose of it that night, didn't you? I remember going to General Assembly one time and we had the joint session of General Assembly. I think it was Chattanooga, Tennessee. And uh, a good friend of mine uh, and I had, had gone out to have dinner and we came in and we were a little late for the, for the joint worship service. So we had to sit down front. Well, all the black ministers and all the black delegates were sitting down front. So Ed and I had to sit down there with them. And about halfway through that service, Ed punched me and he said, you know, I can get happy sitting down here. And I thought, well, you know, maybe Ed, we ought to be getting happy at our worship any time. I recall, uh, some of you will remember uh, uh, Otto Duncan, preached at Quinn Chapel for years. Came out here first night of every revival. And 
I went, I don't know if I ever told this story or not, I went to, to, to hear Otto preach one morning. And I went to Queen's Chapel and I sat down, there's only a white person in there. And I sat down in the pew and Otto came back and I said, Otto, do I have anybody seat? You know, because that's what you're always concerned about when you go into a different church. Is because Bill sat there for years and if somebody else sat down, he'd throw him out. <laughs> and Otto said, no, but you're not supposed to sit here. You're supposed to sit up there with me. And I said, no, Otto, I, I can't. No, he said, that's the way it is. Because when you, as a, as a minister, go into an African-American church, you, are, you participate in the service. So Otto drug me up here, and here I am. I'm the only white guy in there. I'm as comfortable as Presbyterian. He's a Methodist. And the next thing, I'm doing the responsive reading. And it comes time for communion. And Otto says, Frank, you serve the bread. I'll serve the wine. I said, Otto, I'm not ordained in the Methodist church. He said, this is the way it ought to be, happy brother. <laughs> so we serve communion. But we've come a long ways. We've come a long way in our relationship with, with the African American uh, population and, and our brothers and sisters of that color. Largely due to the efforts of Dr. King back in the 60s. And I sure wish I could march with him. I wish I had. But I was too busy thinking about things that were wonderful. I really let the important things go. And as I think about it now, I look at what went on with the Civil Rights Movement back in the 60s. And, and I know that there were a lot of times when Dr. King had to become so frustrated that he had to ask himself, okay, I've got myself in this situation. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? Because, you know, we think about, we, we don't think so much about what the, the minorities thought at that time. We could see that they were, uh, we didn't want them drinking from our water fountains. We didn't want them going to our restaurants. We didn't want a lot of things. But I'm sure that it had to be a lot of things going through his mind from time to time where he didn't think very much of us. And I'm sure that many times he had to ask himself, okay, what would Jesus do? When I look at, at the history of, of, of our country, when it comes to civil rights, I'm afraid we don't have a really good record. We came here back in the early, early days after Columbus came over and he brought them all over on the Mayflower, and what did we do? Well, we began to take the land away from the Native Americans, didn't we? We gave them fire water to keep them drunk so they wouldn't cause us any problem. And basically, we took, them, we took over the, Af or the, uh, the Native Americans and we put them on the reservations. Now, that was really a, 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 a really good way to treat uh, uh, the, African or the uh, Native Americans, wasn't it? But we did it. And I'm not saying that it's, it's our, our country, but, but this, is, this is what we have always done, even in, in, the, in the days in Europe. And as we look at all that's going on today, and I, I, I hear people talk about the Hispanic population coming into this country, and I'm not going to get into legal and illegal immigration, but as Christian people, we have a responsibility. And I don't care what your politics are. It really doesn't matter. We need to be Christians first. Amen. And when people are suffering, if we're going to bring them in this country, okay, bring them in the way that needs to be brought in. Do it the right way. But friends, we can't be calling these Middle Easterners ragheads. What would, Jesus, what would Jesus do in this situation? Ask yourself that. He went, to the, he, he went to the well at Samaria, and there he met that woman. And the Jews and the Samaritans didn't get along. She said, why are you talking to me? And nothing's changed over there, has it? But 
what did Jesus do? He talked with her. He talked with her about living water. He talked with her about more important things than the Jews and the Samaritans. And what happened in the end? All the people from the town came out to ask Jesus to stay for two days. And they all believed. The role of the church in today's age is not to sort through all the people and determine who we're going to allow in and who we're not going to allow in. That race, religion. We say, well, the Muslims don't believe the way we do. No, they don't believe the way we do. I'm a common Presbyterian. And there are Baptists in this church don't believe the way I do. <coughs> but we've worshipped together for a long time, haven't we? Amen. How in the world can we win the world for Christ if we want to fight with them all the time? How in the world can we win uh, the world for Christ if we're not willing to sit down and talk with people? We finally got the African American problem solved because we finally had to accept the fact that we're going to have to accept them as equals. So now, who, now what's the next one? Well, then we have the Hispanic group, don't we? I can remember when there was a Hispanic family moved in down the street from us, bought a house down there, and I'm going to tell you what, with the black neighbors of Catacombus across from us and the, met, and the Hispanic family down the street, our street was doomed. Uh, neighborhoods going to hell. That was what the general expression was. Well, it hasn't. How could we expect to win the Hispanic family to Christ if we didn't communicate with them and if we shut them out? There's more to the civil rights movement than civil rights. What would Jesus do? I heard one politician here the other day said uh, something that, that, that the sands of Iraq would blow in the dark if he were president. And I thought, oh my God. What kind of thinking is that? What would Jesus do? You ever ask yourself that? When you get yourself in a real tight situation, do you ever ask, what would Jesus do? I'm dealing here with a, with, with a situation with another human being. What would Jesus do? How would he handle it? He taught us in his word how to handle it. He showed us in this interaction here with the Samaritan woman uh, how he would handle it. Fear makes us do crazy things. Fear makes us do stupid things. But if we continue to ask ourselves, what would Jesus do? We take away that fear. It's time to get rid of the fear in our lives and start doing the work of the church. And if we're going to win the work of Christ, we're going to have to reach out. We're going to have to accept a lot of people. You used to hear me say a lot of times, I know you've heard it, so you probably got tired of hearing it. If we're going to win the sinners to Christ, we got to love the sinners, don't we? Amen. If we're going to win the world to Christ, we got to love the world. we got to put aside all, this, uh, all the, the, the racial issues. We have to put aside the religious issues. I was talking with a fellow that uh, had been in Iran and he was a missionary there, and he, they don't like missionaries in Iran. So he said that he was there with a, a business of some kind, but his real job was to be a missionary. And he said, what we really did is we just looked for an opportunity to share Christ. Once in a while, that opportunity would come up. And we'd get that opportunity to share Christ. And he said, and that's what we did. He said, I can't go back to Iran because I found out what I was doing. We're looking for an opportunity 
to share Christ. Not to condemn, not to hate. There's enough haters in this world without them being in the church, folks. So, let, let's, let's ask ourselves, what would Jesus do? Back on August 28th, 1963, Dr. Martin Luther King spoke these words from the Lincoln Memorial. He said, when we allow freedom to reign, we will be able to speed up that day when all God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of that old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thank God all the while. We are free. And in the words of Forrest Hill, that's all I got to say about that. Just let's pray. Father, we confess to you this morning that our hearts are not as pure as we would. We confess that we have racial prejudice and bigotry in our hearts. We confess that we are angry. We confess that there is hate. We ask this morning in the name of Jesus that you remove that from our lives. And that we might look at this world around us and as we, we begin to feel ill toward another person or another religion or another race. We might ask ourselves, what would Jesus do? And then do as he would say. We pray, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. The prayer has to be seen 592. 592.